African story has been written by others. We need to own our problems and solutions and write our own story. That is a quote by Rwanda's President Paul Kagame, which reverberates across the continent today. Hello, Abarienu, Keftama, how's it? Sawubora, Dewo, Salama Aleiku, and welcome to One Africa, a weekly show that begins tonight from politics, economy, sport, fashion, culture, and diversity in the continent. You name it. This will be the go-to channel that highlights these African stories to the world. I'm your host, Eric Njoka, and the show starts right now. An attack on a church in one of Nigeria's safest states has been condemned by one leaders and even the Pope. At least 50 people were killed in the attack, including children, when gunmen stormed the St. Francis Church in Ondo State. They opened fire indiscriminately at worshippers inside and outside the church compound. The World Health Organization expects the number of COVID-19 deaths in the African region to fall sharply this year compared to 2021. The prediction is a hopeful one for the world's least vaccinated continent. The Central African Republic is still championing its decision to adopt Bitcoin as a legal tender. President Faustin Achange Toadera has been praising the move on social media. The CAR became only the second country following El Salvador to adopt Bitcoin as a legal tender. Two elevated concrete guideways are emerging across the desert east and west of Cairo, forming what will be the world's longest monorail. And Morocco unveiled its $2 million supercar. The Laraki epitome has not one, but two gas tanks. When fueled with 110 octane, it is capable of generating 1,750 horsepower. Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital city, opened its doors to a restaurant featuring two- and three-dimensional deco that guests say makes them feel like they are in a comic book or cartoon. The restaurant has become a hot spot for lovers of art, food and fun. It is full of young people or millennials who say the restaurant is an Instagram worthy. Take a look. Walking into this restaurant in the heart of Lagos gives diners the illusion of walking into a giant coloring book and in a fun way beckoning guests to bring in their crayons. Located in the heart of Lagos, Sketch Lagos opened two months ago. It has Egyptian-themed murals in black and white painted on its walls, floor and ceiling. The concept was inspired by the need to do something different for food and art lovers. It's a new idea in, in Lagos and I think all people love, love to see a new, something new. Not just a restaurant come and eat and laugh. Uh, it's very good for uh, ambience, it's very good for, uh, for pictures, it's very good, very good restaurant. And you will see here all people love, love uh, painting, love uh, pictures. The restaurant serves a range of budget-friendly foods and drinks including cocktails and African-inspired dishes. Customers come in and are eager to know what the paintings represent or mean and the restaurant takes this as an opportunity to educate them on Egyptian art and symbols. Diners get a feeling of a place they have never visited before while learning about the Egyptian pyramids which were originally built as tombs and the different gods they worshipped. It makes me feel like I'm in another place, like I can't even place where I am. <laughs> It does make you feel like you've entered into like art. Like I feel like I'm a part of art being in here. It's an amazing way to get people to, you know, see art in another form because it's a restaurant and at the same time they're able to experience art in, you know, a very, very beautiful way. The fact that every corner of this restaurant has, you know, something about, I think it's the Egyptian art. So it's a way to really get people to not just see art, but at the same time eat. So I feel like it's something everybody would, you know, love to experience. 
Many Africans are now coming up with innovative ways to spice up their business to be above their competitors in the industry. And this restaurant in Abuja is standing out because it does not follow the conventional interior designs of most eating places around the world. South African artist Esther Mahalangu has won international acclaim for transforming traditional debele designs into bold contemporary abstract paintings. Apart from large-scale public installations, Mahalangu's work has been used on jumbo jets and BMW cars. Now in her 80s, she's focusing on promoting her art from home. Here in Zia Buswa in the Mpumalanga province, South African artist Esther Mahalangu, or Maestra, dances with a troop of athletic Dembele dancers who visited her home and joins them with a spirited shuffle. Now frail in her mid-80s, Mahalangu wears traditional necklaces, blankets, beads and fabrics, dressing with the same startling flair that adorns her famous paintings. South Africa's Dembele people, one of several ethnic groups in the country's 60 million people, largely live in northeastern parts of South Africa and are known for their distinctive decorations and dress. Excelling at the traditional craft of painting huts and buildings in lively geometric designs, Mahalangu has taken the generation's old Dembele craft and won it at an acclaimed place in the world of contemporary abstract art. Most arresting is the spark in her eyes when she discusses her mission of keeping alive the culture of South Africa's Dembele people. For me, it's about the young children. I want them to know my work and learn how to do it like me. I want them to know it so well so that their children can know where the heritage comes from. In Rebele, we are happy. No longer confined to rural South Africa, Mahalangu's graphic art has enlivened jumbo jets, BMWs and large-scale public installations. Mahalangu's international success has allowed her to build a spacious compound of several buildings, including a gallery and guest house, all decorated with her designs. What's notable about Mum Esther's work is most definitely the colours and the way in which she's able to symmetrically make the colors come alive and not make it feel like it's a, a how to say, an assault on one's eyes. And I think that goes back into her own understanding of spiritually what colors mean to one when they see it, but also contemporary, what a contemporary colors mean now. As a lot of people will know, her first international exhibition took place in Paris in 1989. Um, this means that she was in her 50s when she was part of her first uh, group exhibition internationally. Um, from that point, we can definitely track how her career has grown and expanded into different areas of um, you know, the, the global art world, um, especially internationally. Although Mahalangu is no longer painting, she champions Dembele culture from her home. She has made her mark on the world art stage because she is able to, with time, constantly change and reinvent herself. Before the year ends, talk and all the bars will be about Africa. Why? Because some of the countries in the continent will be or will have to decide on who shapes their future through the ballot. Multiple elections are intended to restart democratic processes and resume constitutional governance in Kenya, Sudan, Somaliland and Angola. What are the parameters that shape these electoral processes and what makes these polls in 2022 unique? Let's find out in this next report. It is election season. Polls in key African nations this year will give a sense which way the continent is headed. Given its intricate political structure, the pandemic and conflicts in the continent still pose a challenge in this year's polls, making the race to the ballot dynamic and complex. Africans are still frustrated with the gap between promise and reality. And that is not likely to change as much because it has been the norm each year. 
Though various political analysts predict a shift from the ordinary this year, with their binoculars trailed on at least five nations, Kenya, Chad, Senegal, Angola. Kenya's last presidential election in 2017 was a saga filled with drama and the country's Supreme Court found serious irregularities in the electoral process. President Uhuru Kenyatta's victory was, however, confirmed following a rerun. William Ruto, the current deputy president and longtime opposition leader Raila Odinga, are the front runners this time in the upcoming August polls. What we are looking to do is to create a movement, a movement that delivers Kenya safely across the Rubicon to the other side. That is what we are looking for. Despite challenges in ethnic violence and allegations of vote rigging over the years, Kenya has a history of competitive electoral process and the nation has been an outspoken defender of upholding democratic norms in the region. Angola's ruling Movimento Popular de Libertacao de Angola, or MPLA, has been in power since it gained independence from Portugal in 1975. Voters in the country are also headed to the ballot in August, which is considered a first real test of President João Lourenço, who faces a united opposition from a new coalition called the United Patriotic Front. And we are sure that with the commitment of young people, the commitment of women and the commitment of our activists, we can say with certainty that the August 2022 party is already here. The time has come to build a new and better Angola without unrealistic promises and megalomaniac projects, a working Angola where everyone has a place and to which everyone can contribute. The time has come to put an end to corruption, to theft. The time has come for a democratic change. A transitional military council led by Mahamat Idris Debi are holding their fists at the summer elections in Chad Nears. The politics in the country took an unprecedented turn in April 2021 when President Idris Debi comfortably won a sixth term but got killed in clashes between rebels and government forces a day after the results were announced. In spite of the optimism about the elections, Critics say most likely outcome is simulated political reforms that will keep the ruling network in place in charge. After running for over a year behind schedule, the much-anticipated presidential elections were held in war-ridden Horn of Africa nation of Somalia in May. Where the focus was the much-needed legitimacy to rebuild the country following years of insecurity. Hassan Sheikh Mohamud was chosen new president, beating over 35 contenders. The country has not had a strong functioning government since Somalia's national movement and other armed militia groups ousted dictator Ziad Bare in 1991. The new leader will have to contend with the Islamist group Al Shabaab, which has been fighting to overthrow the fragile Western backed government in Mogadishu. He should focus on the security. He should also put on trial and put before justice any government soldier that kills people without reason. We saved the best for last. Africa's most inspiring presidential election of 2022 may take place in a country that is not officially a state. The sovereignty of Somaliland, which claims independence from Somalia, is not recognized by any other country. Its politics are far from perfect. Clan loyalty determines most people's votes and women find it hard to get elected. But its presidential race, which will see Musa Bihi Abdi run for re-election, serves as a reminder. Despite its lack of statehood, Somaliland is more democratic than any other part of Africa. Kenya's August elections will undoubtedly be among the most consequential political events in Africa in 2022. 
If the electoral process takes a wrong turn, it could threaten the country's capacity to continue playing a pivotal regional role going forward. The country's recent history features hotly contested, sometimes violent elections in which candidates and their allies have used identity politics to divide the electorate and turn Kenyans against one another. Already the two main contenders for the presidency, Raila Odinga and William Ruto, have accused each other of foul play, such as attempts to disrupt campaign events or accepting dodgy campaign funding. All in all, the stage is set for a bruising political fight. So why are elections and ethnicity such a touchy affair in Kenya? Let's find out more in this next report. When Kenyans cast their ballots to pick the president, the roles played by ethnicity and tribalism are likely to be decisive. For many Kenyans, this is the mother of all elections. The country's president, Uhuru Kenyatta of the Jubilee Party, has overseen an economy battered by inflation and debt. Bruised by corruption and struggling to get on its feet due to the harm inflicted by COVID. Fighting to be the next president are Kenya's deputy, William Ruto, and the leader of the opposition, Raila Odinga, of the Orange Democratic Movement. The last time Kenyatta and Ruto were on opposing sides of an election in 2007 and 2008, the country was plagued by violence and they ended up on trial in the International Criminal Court. Kenyan politics have been characterized by ethnic tensions since independence in 1963. But it was not until 2007 that the demons of tribalism really flared up after the hotly disputed national elections left many dead and thousands others internally displaced. The clashes mainly between the larger ethnic tribes, the Kikyus, Luos and Kalenjins, erupted. But the political scene has now changed. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta endorsed his former arch-rival for the country's top job, weeks after their parties joined hands ahead of presidential and parliamentary elections in August. We have a team leader in the name of Raila Amolo Odinga. The announcement brings together two of Kenya's top political dynasties who have a long history of opposing each other in elections. This year's contest is shaping up to be a two-horse race between Ruto and Odinga, who belongs to the Luo tribe. A former political prisoner and prime minister, Odinga has secured the support of at least 26 parties, which are now part of Azimio Laumoya coalition. Odinga also did a first by choosing a female running mate in Martha Karua. If the pair wins the high-stakes polls, Karua, a lawyer and former justice minister, would become Kenya's first female deputy president. After 60 years of independence, we cannot be the male domination. We cannot excuse the male domination of the executive. For the first time in the history of our republic, and on the seventh multi party election, history is calling us to close the gender gap in our country. Kenya's deputy president, William Ruto, picked a former aide turned fierce critic of President Uhuru Kenyatta to be his running mate in the country's high stakes election in August. Rigati Gachagua, who served as Kenyatta's personal assistant between 2001 and 2006, was picked after a months-long secretive process marked by intense lobbying. Ruto was initially anointed by Kenyatta as his successor, but found himself marginalized after the 2018 pact between the president and his former foe. I want to say in this uh, podium that Kenya Kwanzaa has confidence in the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission. Ruto has positioned himself as a leader looking to append the status quo in a country ruled by dynasty that have dominated politics for decades.
Despite a positive growth outlook, many Kenyans are still reeling from the economic devastation of COVID-19. And frustrated by corruption in government, they yearn for a government that performs and is accountable to them. From a teacher to climbing one of the highest mountains on earth, Kenyan mountaineer James Kagambi's journey to the top of Mount Everest has been one of hope and determination. At the age of 62, Kagambi is considered and highly regarded as a veteran. He fell in love with mountains back in 1973, and in 2013, he was bestowed the honor of hoisting the flag on Mount Kenya to mark the country's 50 years of independence. He is the first Kenyan to conquer Mount Everest. Why did he see it fit to climb one of the world's tallest mountains? Only he can answer that. Check out his story next. Just most of you are sleeping. I'm broadcasting from Everest Base Camp, courtesy of Full Sack on KG Expedition. Believe me or not, it is happening. I was like, I want to be the first black person on Everest. And then somebody from the Sudo, no, a few South Africans tried in 1996, but there was a big accident there. Fortunately, they were not affected, but we lost a lot of people. Wow. And then Three or four years later, a guy from Lesotho also summited, so he was the first black. When we did the second Denali ascent, yeah. I was leading the first African-American expedition, uh -huh. and that was 2013. Again, that to me, I say it's my highlight. After that, I met Phil, the leader of Everest, um, was on another expedition with some other people from North Face who are up here, like when I mentioned them. Somebody who knows mountaineering said, you've been climbing with that person? Yeah. You know, like, they are celebrities. Yes. And I started thinking then, what about if we did this for Everest? But I didn't talk about it. Which year? That is 2013. Uh -huh. I didn't talk about it. Yeah. And then Theo was also thinking about it. Then he passed the same message to Conrad Anker, who's a, he's a North Face mountaineer. Wow. And this guy also continued pondering about it. And Theo, eventually... Uh, two years ago, I started thinking about it. And last year in January, he called me and said, Keiji, you're going to Everest and you're on the team. You know, Phil, I'm 62. And I know I'm going. Said, oh, no, it's just not a fact. I said, okay, my knees are not good. Oh, no, 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 no. That's okay. The reason why we want you on this expedition is we know you're a good motivator. Some of the two leaders I was with on uh, the Nile are, are coming on that. And he saw, as I, I'm a very good supporter of women in, in that level, he saw me as that. He saw me as somebody who's good with team building and all that. And um, he wanted that expertise in me. Hello, Kenan. This is Chase James Kagandi from the top of Everest. Today is a drop. Oh, wow. Yeah, 2022. The time is about 7 a.m. 7.15 there. I wanted to say, I'm on the top of the I'm on top of Everest. I also want to have a prayer right here. It's an opportunity, like any other. But I know I'm honored to be yeah. on it. If, when I summit, I know it will take even further. It will give me more goals. Because that's not the limit. Um, I know it will be um, pushing my limits. Yeah. And um, again, I'm ready for that. Uh, it's not, apart from the high, high altitude, it, I don't see anything else that is chal that challenging. First of all, I, I, I feel energized, especially when I'm doing something that I want other people to taste. So when I have somebody else, I like introducing them to the mountains in a good way. Find the best time, the best pace for them. I learned so much. It takes a lot out of me. When I'm in deep thoughts, when I have uh, a lot of things I'm thinking about, when I go to the mountain, all that stops. Mountains can change your life quite a bit. It can change the way you're thinking, the way you look at things, 
the way you just present yourself. And then the most important thing for me is it makes you realize what is important in your life. When you're down here, you have so many things, but you take them uh, granted. You know, it's like if you, you, you are having everything, but if, when you're up there, there's so many things you don't have. And that's when you, you start realizing. That's it on this episode of One Africa. Feel free to suggest stories that you want to see in our next episode. Write to weonnews.com or even tweet us at weonnews. I will see you next week, same time, same place. For now, we leave you with these images from Africa. Kwaheri. <laughs>